Good evening. Today is November 1st. This is, I'm Pam Caruso with the League of Women Voters of Alabama, and welcome to day two of our Alabama Community Mapping Forum, number two. This forum is a collaboration of several Alabama organizations across the state, including the League of Women Voters, ACLU, Alabama Values, Alabama Values Progress, Alabama Forward, Alabama Election Protection Network, TOPS, and the Legal Defense Fund. We are recording this forum and live streaming to the League of Women Voters Alabama Facebook page. Also, we have the closed caption capability turned on. All you have to do is go to the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on turn the subtitles on. For those watching on Zoom, please ask questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We will answer any questions that come in at the end of tonight, depending on how the time runs. I do hope you watched our first forum on October 13th, where we discussed fair maps from a legal viewpoint and also went over a fair maps checklist that can be used to evaluate the fairness of maps in Alabama. And last week, uh, on the 28th of October, we had our first forum number two event where we covered the legislature proceedings and what we expected. Our goals tonight in the next three evenings is to engage with these organizations and citizens to provide a united response to the maps that the Alabama le legislature will ultimately pass. Uh, Kathy, could you put up the slide for the five night schedule, please? Okay, as I mentioned, this is the first of five nights. Uh, we, we had our first event last Thursday night. This is November 1st, Monday. We're gonna, tonight we're gonna review the state house maps and we'll do a summary of today's special session. And we also are including a round table discussion on env environmental issues that are impacting the voters in, in Alabama and, their, and how the mapping process itself affects your environmental uh, um, conditions in Alabama. Tomorrow night, we're gonna review the state Senate maps and we'll do again a summary of the day's special session. On Wednesday night, we're reviewing the congressional maps. And on Thursday, we're, this is, uh, our agenda is, is being revised. We are uh, gonna talk as a group and decide what we wanna discuss on November 4th but we, we expect it will have a, a kind of a recap of what happened and what citizens can do in the future. All right. So tonight we were, we were gonna focus on the Alabama state fat, uh, maps that were released last week. Um, they, they are moving very quickly through um, the legislature and we will have several organizations that will cover the review of the house maps. Uh, we will also, as I said, we'll have a roundtable discussion on the environment, environmental issues and how the maps just released impact environmental issues. But before we begin our roundtable discussion, we will be sharing videos and other communication video, media from the work, good work that Alabama Values Progress is providing to the community. And Kendra Majors with Alabama Values Progress will give a recap of what went on today during the legislature. And to start off, could we please show the first video? Or is a discussion tonight, whichever, yeah. It's a mixture tonight. It's a little different than last week um, as it's kind of been a really busy time a Friday and today. So we're gonna just kind of show y'all some clips from what we saw on Friday during the House State Government Committee meeting. So of course, I'm gonna start off by talking about that committee meeting tonight. Um, the committee met on Friday to give um, a favorable favorable report on the congressional and state house maps so they could be introduced today in the house chamber um, after discussion it did ultimately give a favorable report um, except for it was it passed six to four with one abstination on friday um, during the meeting as we have seen in other meetings and during the public hearings we saw some legislators and community members who voiced some concerns over the proposed maps um, to start things off, former Representative Paul Beckman spoke to remind the committee about Alabama's one-year rule, which says that candidates must live in a district one year prior to the election. And he also, he was a little sympathetic to them because he said he had been in their shoes before. And we're gonna show you a clip of his discussion with the committee right now.
<clears throat> Beckman, I sat here as your vice chair for this committee in 2016, 2014, and 2010, and during the litigation period. My question to y'all is this, does the governor or do y'all plan to get this out before the 3rd of November? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay. Given, given the extreme amount of work that goes on behind the scenes after this bill is passed with the registrars and probate judges all over the state, I think we need to. The reason Fortunately, we're in a very compressed time, as you well know, due to the, the late arrival of our numbers. And the reason why I ask is under Section 47, you have mm -hmm. one year as far as the resident issue. And as of the third, it'll be one year. So the question is, if, if it exceeds past the third, the question does the one year does not apply, then you have to go to the attorney general's opinion. And as you well aware, that's not law, that's persuasive. So that's my concern in reference. I right now represent uh, the GOP in the Tauga County and as the chairperson and I sat here with you. So I understand what you all have done and what you all are doing. And my hats are off to you because it's a hard work. It's not an easy job sitting there listening to the complaints or people that have been divided out as far as whatever possibility there is because there, there, there is all sorts of equations. I just want to let you know that as far as our area, as far as Otago County, as the chairperson, I've been preaching since January 1, watch the lines. If you plan on running as a candidate, that basically it is not cut in stone because they can change. So you need to keep that under your hat when people think because that was my job and make sure that they were responsible. But again, I want to thank you very much and thank you for your Yeah, so we can see by from Pringle's comments that they really are gonna push this through really, really quickly. So we, uh, I think everyone's preparing for that. Um, also during that meeting, several Montgomery and spoke at the meeting regarding District 74. Um, they were upset about the new makeup and boundaries of the district. Um, under the proposed changes, they make District 74 52% black and 40% white. The current demographic breakdown for the 2017 map for District 74 is just over 67% white and just under 26% black. Current Representative Charlotte Meadows, who is a Republican, said the core of the community had changed completely with the new maps. Let's take a look at a clip from where she spoke at the meeting also. Good morning to the committee. I appreciate you all being here. Um, I believe most people in this room in the state of Alabama are aware of uh, District 74 now. Um, it's not a notoriety that I will have sought but it is the situation we're in, and I wanted to talk to this committee about my district. I represent a significant part of Montgomery County that in 2010 ran under the, 20, the 2000 census lines. In 2013, when I ran the first time for this seat, I ran under the, 20, the 2000 census lines. In 2014, when Dimitri Polisos ran for that seat, he ran under the new 2010 census lines. Those lines were changed in 2017 to reflect a lawsuit that was uh, allowed those district lines to be changed. And so he ran again under a brand new set of district lines in 2018. And now we're looking at completely upending this district again for me to run in 2022, which I believe is not fair to the people of District 74. This is a community that has um, been a significant part of Montgomery County. It stretches all the way down the Atlanta Highway um, and that's been the, co the core of that um, district for a number of years. The core has now changed um, based on this new map. Okay, so Meadow, she wasn't the only person that spoke against the proposed change for District 74. Um, also, we heard from former Representative Perry Hafer. Um, he said that he thought it was the wrong way that the plan was done specifically by taking what he said was precincts from district four or 74 and he did say he understood that like he understood the reason that they were having to do that but he asked the legislator to help charlotte and help those people in the district then we heard from montgomery county republican chair greg cool who said that he didn't understand the basis of how the new maps were drawn and that they were drawn drastically differently. So in response to that, 
Representative Pringle said that he could not undo the demographic shifts that had happened in Montgomery County or around the state, saying that there were others who were upset about where people had moved, had been moved to in their districts and the demographic shifts. So also District 74 was not the only district where citizens voiced their concerns at that meeting on Friday. Um, Ms. Maddox from Otaga County spoke about the changing of District 88. Um, we have a clip of that also. Good morning. My name is Carla Maddox. I'm a member of the Otaga Carla. Committee. Carla, yes. I'm a member of the Otaga County Executive Committee. However, today I am here as a concerned citizen for District 88. Um, right now, what we are looking at is having our county completely separated. Um, we, are, we are looking at half of the city of Prattville being represented, and this is where I live. My part of the, the county is gonna be lumped in with Selma. Um, and then we're looking at where the line is drawn is that up 31. You? That was behind you on the map? Yes. Yes. And where we are looking at with 31, our district has been cut off there. Now, my concern with that is we have a candidate who is running for District 88 who has now been drawn out of his district. And it is my understanding that precedent has been set with another candidate who was drawn out of her district. However, the lines were redrawn to allow her to continue running for her seat. So my question is, will this be taken into account? And if, if, if so, how long is it gonna take to get that line fixed for the candidate that is running in 88? That's, uh, that goes back to having to adjust House District 68, I believe, and we had to add more population to the district to the north of it. So, so is there any chance that our candidate who has been drawn out of the line by literally like, I want to say it's like 50 feet-ish, he has been drawn <laughs> out of our I, district? I don't know the candidate you're referring to, but if you look at that map, that those are whole precincts. Oh, yes. Yeah. And his, okay. his house is literally the line. Yeah, yeah. I, listen, I, I've seen a lot of that. <laughs> a lot of people live right on the line. but. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to debate this bill and we're going to do an analysis of, of those districts. And uh, again, it's it's all an attempt to comply with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Okay, thank all you right. so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. So after she spoke, uh, a few other people spoke, but eventually they heard from um, the, the candidate who is Josh Pendergrass, who is a lawyer and he used to be the communication director for Governor Ivey. Um, he said that he had announced his candidacy last June that he would seek the, the Republican nomination for House District 88. Um, said he was already raising campaign money and he has campaign signs all, all out in Prattville. Um, the district has historically contained the city of Prattville and the new map splits the city of Prattville between I think it's District 88 and District 69, um, which is currently Kelvin Lawrence's district. Um, and with the split, he would no longer live in the district that he's announced his bid for. Um, he questioned the committee saying that splitting the district splits the core of the community that is represented by District 88 and said that the proposed map likely won't even give the city of Prattville a single representative. Um, so anyway, looking at the proposed map, he felt like his it was he was pretty much drawn out of it. Um, Pringle, of course, told him that the reapportionment committee had no idea, you know, where he lived at. Um, anyway, I'll leave that for y'all to decide on that. But speaking of the community's core, um, Representative Barbara Boyd asked for clarification on what the actual definition of a core is. Um, Pringle committed to getting that definition of what a core is. Um, if y'all remember, or if, even for those of you who haven't, you know, actually been actively like paying attention, uh, they, in their rules for redistricting, they say they're going to maintain the core of the district. So that's kind of important for them to know, you know, what a core is. Um, later on, Representative Mike Ball, he also had an interesting dialogue. Um, he made a few comments. Um, he said that the rules keep changing and that there's a lot of problems in Alabama 
that came from the reluctance of Alabamians to have African American representation. And then he spoke about how that the state didn't even redistrict for 60 years because of the reluctance to have African American rep representation. Um, then he said his main issue was that with the rule this time of having plus or minus 5% deviation that he was concerned because right now, according to him, Madison County, where, which he represents, is in the upper end of that deviation, and he foresees that the growth that they've been experiencing is going to continue. So within a few years, it will put them, you know, way ahead on that deviation. So he said he also felt that Madison County should have picked up another district, but he also said that he knows it's because of politics. Um, but also said he wasn't pleased with the maps, but he also said he would go ahead and, you know, vote for the maps. So anyway, um, let's see. Pringle said during the meeting that he and the committee members were doing everything in their power to keep from having court action. Um, I'll throw in that our own Evan Milligan um, from Alabama Ford um, spoke briefly and um, kindly reminded Pringle and, and, the, and, and the committee about findings that there is a need for a second, minor, second majority minority district. Um, they also heard from um, a Mr. Elkins who spoke on gerrymandering. And here's a clip of that conversation, which was kind of interesting. There is always an argument, and you'll hear us talk about two terms, packing and cracking. We cannot pack people into a district and we cannot crack community. We cannot pack and we cannot crack communities of interest in order to achieve um, a political gerrymandering is one thing. Racial gerrymandering is a totally different subject. Is there a difference? Yes. Well, not the way you do the, the, leg the, the districts because yeah. Republicans traditionally have a group of demographics and, Repub and Democrats traditionally have a, 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 a group of demographics and we're trying to put all those people in, in their respective areas so they can vote a particular way. We, we, I don't see the difference between political or race at this point. This is like peeling an onion. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to my chair. But I, I, your time has expired. But all right. So as you can see from the clips, there's a lot of concerns about the maps presented. Um, fast forward to today's meetings, they've been longer. Um, I've been watching the House today and I'm going to look over the State Senate later, later tonight, but I do know that the State Senate passed the Senate Bill 1 today, which is the State, the state Senate plan. Um, the House also passed House Bill 1, which is the congressional map after much debate and discussion. Um, they have been, ta they've taken two recesses so far today and are in the middle of discussing House Bill 2, which is the state house plan. They were set to reconvene at 630. Um, I'm not sure if they've already reconvened or not because the house doesn't have a really good track record of starting on time. They have um, not. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, I'll have more information about that for you tomorrow during our session tomorrow. And also you can check out, um, some more more stuff, great stuff that we're doing at Alabama Values Progress on our social media, including some updated episodes of Frame It like you saw on um, Thursday night and some other stuff that we're doing through AVP. So thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Kendra. I, I did want to point out on that candidate that's running for office being out of the district that there's no he has no standing, does he? I thought they only protected incumbents. That's what they were looking at, not potential candidates. Yeah, and if you if you were listening to the clip from Mr. Beckman, who was spec first, he's over like the Republican Party in Otago County, and he said that he's been preaching to all these potential candidates that they need to watch the line. So, um, I mean, whether what they choose to do with that, you know, is you know up to them. But you know, I think that's a situation where you know he was warned, um, and probably just unfortunate. He probably will either have, to, you know. So we'll see what happens. That will definitely be interesting. Yeah, so, and I, I did, we will bring up what Mike Ball said about um, the, the large districts here in North Alabama. That'll come up in our discussion tonight because it was noticed when we did reviews. Hey, thank you so much. It was a great recap and we appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, as I mentioned, our uh, roundtable discussion tonight is focusing on environmental issues facing Alabama and how the way maps are drawn impacts, impacts these environmental issues. But before we get started, we are delighted that Catherine Coleman Flowers, the founding director of the Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice, the Rural Development Manager of the Equal Justice Initiative, and the Vice Chair of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, Council agreed to make a short video for us tonight. And uh, she made this while she's attending the UN Climate Change Summit in Scotland. Um, Kathy, could you please start the video? And also, I, I need to warn you that it's the sound isn't really high quality, so you may have to turn up your volume as much as you can. Okay. I had to switch computers. Are you being able to pull it up, Kathy? I don't get involved when it comes to the video's not showing. It will determine whether or not we have clean water for generations. Thank you. Tonight, uh, we'll get back to that. Catherine, uh, we really appreciate her taking her time to do that tonight for us. We're very pleased to have Kathleen Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick the Climate Change and Strategic Initiatives Directives, Director for Hometown Action, Cindy Lowry, the Executive Director of Alabama Rivers Alliance, and Tish Gotel Fox, the legal director for the ACLU Alabama tonight to speak on envi environmental issues. Kathy, are all those up, their videos up? I think Kathy might be having computer issues. Yeah, is somebody else on to, um, did she share? with anybody. All right, I don't know if she can take the host. Okay, would you please put um, Tish and Cindy up and uh, uh, Kathleen Kirkpatrick? Okay, hold on, I got it. Okay, I got it for a second. Now, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have that capacity. All right. Capability. I got it, I got it. I wish I had uh, to reclaim the host. Can. Hi, can you please spotlight them? I'm doing that. All right. And then. Um, All right. As, as, as you watch that video, which you didn't watch, but I, you, I know you know what she said. And you're thinking about going, what is going on right now in the Alabama legislature. Can you pull up Kath, um, Kathleen, Kathy? She needs to start her. her um, video. There, there she is. is. Yeah, I've yeah. been trying. There we are. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts tonight on what would fair maps in Al would fair maps in Alabama make a difference in the states, counties, and communities response to the environment? And that includes everything, the river, air, sewage, Superfund sites, etc. Um, who'd like to lead off on this? Kathleen, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, and, you know, just to, to say that, you know, environmental issues 
don't necessarily recognize geopolitical boundaries, but how we address them very much has to do with the decision makers who are doing things like managing federal funds that are coming from in, for infrastructure. Uh, they County commissioners can control land use decisions, um, any number of things that are going to affect Um, people who are, are classically disenfranchised, both from voting and are living in poverty and uh, do not necessarily have a voice in making these decisions are the ones who are disproportionately impacted. So for instance, during the pandemic, we've definitely seen folks who are living in poverty, um, maybe without adequate sewage or drinking water. Um, you know, in Jackson, Mississippi has a really horrendous situation right now, similar to what we saw in, in, um, in Detroit a few years ago with their, their potable water system. But a lot of people haven't heard about it, which is really unfortunate. And we're on the brink of similar issues in much of Alabama um, and just with, with the, the disregard for environmental justice issues and um, the, the lack of, of concern for making decisions to support reforms, whether that's um, in improving infrastructure, but we also need to think about decisions about locating facilities. Uh, for instance, I, I, I'm going to speak to the county level. Uh, a lot of times decisions are made to really like give away tax benefits for the county by letting um, a manufacturing facility locate and then trying to attract them by by reducing their tax liability. And then what that does is has, has a greater impact, you know, depending on the facility, of course, has a greater impact on everything from, from roads to sewer to you know, other infrastructure and also the, the toxic releases. And, and not even like what we would think of as, as toxins necessarily or things that are classified as hazardous waste, but just the, the air pollutants such as dust that are, are not as easily regulated or stormwater that's causing sedimentation. So, I mean, it's, it's complicated. Uh, uh, sustainability is inherently complicated. And, and when it comes to climate, we've got to be thinking about issues such as the built environment, building codes, for instance. Building codes really need to be advanced to plan for the frequency and duration of storms they we're expecting stormwater is a huge issue that um, not many people really take the time to understand until it's hit them. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to uh, dominate the conversation here, but uh, suffice it to say it's complicated. The people that we elect who are in control of how the money is spent and how a lot of the decisions are made are directly affected by redistricting and and how we we choose our leaders thank you yeah okay tish would you like to add on there absolutely um one of the things that i think we have to be mindful about when we are talking about districting counties communities of interest um often what we see in alabama is that a county's delegation or legislative delegation can go a long way to working uh, at the state legislature and then with county executives, mayors, city councils uh, to really work towards investing in uh, the communities that need support and impact. The interesting thing about a few of those delegations is that they tend to be dominated by folks who are not living in the urbanized areas where some of the infrastructure building needs to go. For example, Jefferson County is cracked in a lot of ways such that although the city and the suburbs need a particular type of policy, uh, there are lots of rural legislators 
who are members of that delegation because of the way the lines are drawn. Similar for Montgomery County, where you have some very distinct urban issues. However, the Montgomery delegation is infiltrated, for lack of a better word, by the more rural representatives further out from the city center. Um, as we are looking, we know that it's important that we keep communities of interest together. One of the ways to do that is by respecting county lines. But we also have to keep in mind that when it comes to investing in the important things that we know Alabama has left people behind, redistricting and calling on those delegations to improve access to municipal water and wastewater treatment, to improve business development and uh, technical school development and jobs and the types of jobs that invest in communities. All of those things come down to redistricting lines. And right now we are at a critical juncture and the people of Alabama need to make their representatives aware of their concerns on this point. Thank you. Yeah, and Cindy? Yeah, I mean, these guys brought out so many great points. And so I'll just um, try to play on those and maybe give a little more um, specifics about some of the things that we've worked on at the Alabama Rivers Alliance. So from the, um, from the big picture perspective, uh, one of the things that really strikes me about the redistricting and the way the maps are drawn is the lack of um, competitive districts and the way that the maps are drawn in a way, in a way to protect the incumbents. And as Tish just mentioned, we have to imagine, uh, both, of, both ladies mentioned how important it is to who our elected officials are and the decisions they're making about, um, you know, about our environment and about everything that matters to us in our communities. And if the, the districts aren't competitive, you know, one of the ways we change that is, is to have different people elected. And if they're not competitive, people, they're not engaging with constituents when they run as much. They're not debating these issues to get them out there into the, into the world and just and and let people know where they stand. And so that's one of the things as, as environmental organizations that we're constantly telling our members, we, we're not able to get involved in who do you, who do you vote for? Because we're 501c3, so we can only educate voters, but, but we can get them to get involved with their candidates. But if the candidate's just a shoe in because the, the districts are not competitive, then that's not gonna help us change. And we really don't have any environmental champions in our current legislature. We have a few that, that are working with us. We're trying to build stronger champions, but the folks that are supporting a lot of these candidates are not for stronger environmental regulations. Um, we've also worked really hard as an environmental community in the state and particularly um, here at the Alabama Rivers Alliance to try and get uh, some big uh, forward thinking planning, at least, if not a little bit of regulation and policy going around a water management plan for the state. You know, we're not, we're not doing much at all in Alabama to protect our water supplies, to be accountable for our water use. And, um, you know, whoever, who gets the short end of that stick is the same folks that get the short end of all the environmental um, problems. And if you live um, in lower income areas, or if you live further downstream, you're not as, uh, you're, you're the one that's going to be the most harmed if our water supplies are, are short or if they're mismanaged. And the water plan is a legislative issue. It needs to be led by the legislature and, um, and the governor, ideally, but these districts matter for, um, for those kinds of things, too. If we don't have environmental champions, they're not going to be doing proactive things like that. Kathleen mentioned climate change. Water plan is very much related to that, but, but most states are ahead of us on these things. They're ahead of us on um, developing policies that embrace clean uh, energy like solar. And instead, we're, our politicians are standing on the sidelines or blatantly standing in the way <laughs> of, of these kinds of things that'll be good for our state, not only for the, the, the people in the state and the environment, but also for our economy. So we've got to draw lines that are going to make districts competitive and then I'll just, I'll, I'll end with talking about home rule, which was also mentioned, but you know, a lot of these issues when it comes to protecting communities from pollution are very hyper-local. And in, in absence of state 
planning and state big policies, sometimes the county governments want to get involved and say, you can't do this in my county. And that takes a local dele a delegation getting, getting, coming into agreement and passing legislation that then becomes a constitutional amendment. That's not an ideal way to deal with policy at the state level, but it's what we have to deal with here in Alabama because of our constitution. And so we need to be looking at keeping those counties whole. And, and as Tish mentioned in Birmingham, uh, Jefferson County area, it, it's very divided. And I'll say a little bit more about that with a different hat on later when I talk about Birmingham um, from the League of Women Voter perspective. But there's definitely some major ways that the, that the redistricting impacts our environment and that people should care, who care about all of these things. Thank you, thank you. So in a, so in a, what you're really saying is that fair maps could, could help bring the government assistance to communities to get what is needed to resolve their issues. Do you think that's a true statement? Please. In a lot of ways, absolutely. Yeah. And, absolutely. and more important than fixing issues that already exist, making fair maps helps us plan for the catastrophic things that we know are in our future as climate changes. And, and those things are critical. This winter, we could have access to solar power in addition to natural gas. We could reduce our electric bills. We could ensure that people stayed warm. But as it is, we have policies that put fines and fees on solar panels, hotly encourage natural gas, and we know that natural gas is going to be much more expensive over the next few months because of how the economy is moving. And we've got to do better at our planning as well as our custodialship. One of the things that, that we don't address enough in Alabama, and I think you'll be hearing a lot from, from a number of us in the environmental movement about this coming up. We, we've been talking about it, but we're beginning to get more people's attention, is the concept of energy burden. There are, um, there are virtually no incentives in the state of Alabama to improve our buildings, both residential and commercial. Um, there are incentives from the power companies uh, to some degree for um, industrial efficiencies. But you know, other than a few you know, small funds for weatherization of, of substandard homes, there's really not a concerted effort to retrofit existing buildings and especially homes. Uh, and yet we have a, a relatively advanced um, energy code, you know, the, some of the requirements, and, and I won't go into the, some of the background for that, but, but as Tish said, we really need to be thinking ahead about that because it's efficiency, both for, for, um, for energy and for water, is, is really part of what's gonna make a just transition happen more quickly. So, um, you know, especially like rural communities where building codes aren't enforced, um, you know, outside of the, the, the larger cities or even, you know, smaller communities, municipalities that do enforce building codes and have building inspectors. There's a lot going on out there. And, you know, when you hear about people with, you know, four or five, six hundred dollar a month utility bills in the black belt. Um, and these are not folks that are living in 3000 square foot houses, you know, they're living in substandard homes, and um, it's an undue burden on that population. And there's, there's really no good programs to incentivize improving those buildings to get people's utility costs down. And, you know, the, the benefit to of, of greater efficiencies is you know, almost always there's an improvement in health outcomes too. Uh, I talk a lot about green schools and the possibilities for schools as being community hubs, especially in our rural communities. And 
you know, what I, I heard a few years ago about the water being turned off at some Montgomery schools uh, because the schools, the school um, couldn't afford to pay the utility bills. Um, we, we've got real problems. So yeah, uh, we're, we're fraught with issues in Alabama. I, I could go into more, but um, there are some complexities that uh, we really need to educate folks about and you know, get the word out. And among the folks that need to be educated are our elected officials. And that also goes to appointed officials at the local area, which often are affected by these district lines. That could be school board members. It could be planning and zoning officials, which sometimes their districts are the same lines as say the, um, the city council. So, lots of different jurisdictions, lots of levels of decision making, and a lot of power, and I'm not talking about the electrical kind, a lot of power that's, um, that we're entrusting elected officials with. And if I have, if I have enough time to add one more, a couple more comments, do I? Yes, please do. Yeah, so I just, I wanted to um, reiterate that, um, well, I want to give a couple of specific examples about the maps that I think that I, if I understand them correctly, as I've seen them um, so far. And then I just reiterate that urban rural um, sort of rub that happens on many issues definitely happens with the, with the environment too. And, and Tish already mentioned that, you know, some of the ways that the, the maps are drawn, if you've got uh, rural representatives that live in a different county trying to make decisions about the urban areas and some of their issues, then that doesn't always have the same, um, have a good, good result. So one specific example of that is North Birmingham communities. Birmingham is, a, um, those districts are, those communities in North Birmingham that have suffered so much environmental injustice have been drawn completely within, you know, one district, so they're completely, I think for the most part within one district, there's some other urban um, uh, communities that are also dealing with environmental injustices that are in maybe another one right next to it, but they're completely within the county and, and they're historically um, represented by one party. So any rural legislators that represent the Jefferson County district, they, even if they, they, they may not live in Jefferson County, they're grabbing a few here and there that just cross over into Jefferson County. They have to agree on any local legislation or support decisions that are made about North Birmingham, and that may be more difficult to get them to agree on. There's also um, there's also Uniontown in Perry County, which I I'm not saying that this is a problem the way this is drawn. It was a it it, it threw up a little question mark for me, but if you look at Perry County, all of it is represented by one district, um, except for the little foot there that Uniontown sits on, <laughs> which crosses into a couple of different districts, the way, I, the way I see it on the map. And Uniontown is another just community that is just overburdened with environmental injustices and have had some really difficult decisions to make. So I just, I think that looking at how that, that community is represented is very important too. And Tish, I think you were talking and you were on mute, so I didn't know if you were trying to respond, but just wanted to make sure. Um, so those are just a couple of specific mapping examples of, of the way they're drawn right now that I think make it really, um, or something we just need to look at when we're figuring, figuring this out, because it is really important to make sure that these communities that are just, have just been hammered by pollution and, and decision making that hasn't benefited them um, really need to be given priority when we're drawing these lines. Thank you. I think what you're pointing out is that, and this is what we wanted to talk about tonight, was how the map, just the way they draw maps can impact the environmental uh, issues that we are facing. And uh, we appreciate you very much for uh, coming on and talking to us tonight and, and providing your expertise and your insight on, on what's going on. Thank you very much. And right. you've got a, um, you've got someone in the audience that you might want to, that had raised their hand earlier that the NAACP Environmental Justice League lead in Mobile. I just, I didn't know if he was going to bring him, allow him to talk um, on the webinar here. I, I just, um, he had a, he had a comment. Uh, Ramsey, did you want to speak or? Oh, I didn't have any comment. I don't have much to add. I think y'all did a great 
presentation about the potential impacts. There's there's not not much I could potentially add other than just contextualizing for South Alabama, but it's well, we relevant. appreciate your Everybody. time in because we need to continue this dialogue. We'd like to we'll catch up with you uh, real right. soon afterwards. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're gonna we're gonna change um, direction and we're gonna talk to, hear from organizations and citizens on the review of the just released Alabama State House map. Uh, we're gonna start in the Mobile area and then we're gonna head north and go all the way to North Alabama. We're very pleased tonight that the uh, crowd fellows are on to provide their expertise. We have four crowd fellows in Alabama. Stephanie Barnett supports the State League of Women Voters. Uh, Felicia Scalzetti supports AEPN. Kadita Stone supports Alabama Forward and Shalala Dowdy supports the NAACP Mobile. The crowd fellows have been focused on community organizing and part of their, their, what they're supposed to work on is to understand the communities of interest in Alabama and that could be impacted with the map. So they've been working for quite a while on this. Um, could you please turn on, uh, we want Shalala and Sue to be on, Sue Carney, please. So tonight, we first need to have uh, Shalala Dowdy, the crowd fellow, and uh, Sue Carney from Mobile League of Women Voters to discuss their qu quick review of the state house map from a South Alabama, probably mainly Mobile and Baldwin County, because it seems to be getting a lot of attention. Um, welcome. Thank you, Shalala and Sue, for being on tonight. Can you Hi. Can you yeah, can you kind of talk about some of the issues you're seeing in this new state house map that's just been released and, and what the impacts you think are gonna be? Um, yeah, I can. And so, um, so Mobile County currently is represented by 10 representatives and a new map would change that to nine because um, we currently share a house district with Baldwin County, but because they've grown, they don't need to pull from Mobile anymore. Um, and so the county currently has four Democratic representatives, which gives us, the county has 44% that of the representatives being Democratic. And in the last partisan election that we've had, which was, which was November 2020, we had about 43% of our county did vote Democratic to how the voters voted in um, the most recent partisan election. But um, so, on, so on a state level, our issue is set. So on the We've had a lot of hood housing that has gone away. And those, the, those, that housing was obviously in the urban areas and the minority areas. And so that's why a lot of our minority districts, if you look at the deviation, they're like right on the cuffs of, of barely meeting the minimum requirement. Um, they're, kind, they're, they're all like negative four, but that's because they, they were, they're trying to pull people um, that we kind of don't have because the minorities have been um, dispersed. But overall, um, I would say, just to keep it short, because I know we have a time limit, overall on the state level, there needs to be more opportunity districts because we only have 27 of the 105, well, there are only 27 Democratic seats out of the 105, and that's only 26% of representation, and we know the state is close to being almost 40% Democratic. So there's some room for some opportunity districts and for Mobile, one of those could come from maybe um, House District 104, which using these maps, you can't really zoom in and see. Um, but uh, House District 104 could become an opportunity zone if it picks up, there's a, a lower, there's a minority population in District 105. Um, and that could possibly be put in 104 to make it a little bit more competitive. Um, but other than that, we don't have any major issues um, on the House level in Mobile and then Baldwin County for the most part, it's all Republican, all red. And so there really isn't much to be looking into over there, um, over there on their side. Do you have anything, Sue? Uh, no, really, I agree with everything you said. One of the things we were asked to look at um, was uh, the effect of um, HBCUs uh, on redistricting as well as prisons. Uh, in Mobile County, we have one uh, HBCU, uh, Bishop State um, 
but it is not a residential school. So people don't actually live there. So it doesn't really count, so to speak, for redistricting. Uh, also in Mobile County, we only have the uh, Mobile Metro Jail, which houses about 1,500 inmates on a pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, so by no like long term, I guess I could say prisons. So those things were not issues. Um, other than that, uh, Shalila and I talked this afternoon and she's got it all covered. So that was great. All right, thank you. And the big growth there and is, is that there's a lot of growth in Baldwin County, right? Right. So right. Where, where did that HUD housing go? I mean, the HUD, they, they literally demolished it. I grew up in some of it. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was the projects and they demolished it. And the question is, where are those African-Americans? And some of them are outside the city limits, not knowing mm -hmm. that, they in, that they moved outside the city limits. So they're in the county. Um, and then the rest are just very, they're dispersed very well. You can't really, they're mixed in very well in the western part of our county. And the western part of our county is heavily white, heavily Republican. And so they're not in a cluster, they're kind of spread out. So, yeah. Yeah, so they're kind of minimalized in that area. Yeah, because we're not having an influx of people just leaving the city because the city is 51% African-American, 40% white. So, okay. All right. The county, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate your quick look at this because I know it was just very quick. These scenes are, this is happening so quickly. It's hard to keep up. Appreciate you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, two crowd fellows to talk about the middle of the state, along with Cindy Lowry, who just spoke on envir environmental issues. She'll be re representing the League of Women Voters in Birmingham. And we have as two crowd fellows, Felicia Scalzetti from AEPN, and Kadita Stone, who is the crowd fellow for Ford, Alabama. Kathy, can you please bring their video on? And, and thank you so much for agreeing to speak to us tonight. I know this is a quick turnaround. Um, can you spotlight them, please? I was trying to, I had to get it off the share, screen share so I could see. Okay. Just a second. But we, we know it's a quick turnaround, but we do uh, look forward to hearing what you've seen so far in your review. All right, who are we spotlighting? We are spotlighting Cindy, Felicia, and Kadita. Okay. All right, who wants to start off? And you're all muted, so you'll have to unmute. Felicia, do you want the map up or do you want me to leave it down? Um, I suppose that's uh, up to the uh, attendants. I will be looking sideways at my map personally. There we go. All right, Felicia, you want to start off? Uh, sure. I mean, I heard Cindy mention that she was going to talk about home rule, and that's, that's where a lot of, I think, uh, what I was about to speak on comes from. So I don't know, if, Cindy, if you want to set me up. Now, you um, you go, oh, you go, and if there's anything that we discuss at the League of Greater Birmingham, then I'll just kind of jump in afterwards. I, I think you probably have a lot more knowledge about it than I do. Okay. So um, for those of you who, who uh, may or may not know, um, you, you likely know when you have to go vote and on your ballot, there's a lot of extra amendments and things about counties that you don't live in. Um, and that's because in Alabama, we have a thing called limited home rule. Uh, we don't allow our counties to control. Um, ooh, did I just freeze? No, you're fine. Okay. Oh, my computer's acting up. I'm sorry. Um, we don't allow our counties to control basic things like um, the you know, uh, salary of a, you know, tax disperser or something like that. And so anytime you want to change things like that, you have to get it passed, um, you know, as law. And in some counties, we have uh, committees that sit in um, the state house and the state Senate. Jefferson County is one of, of one of those counties. And so what matters here is not only the fact that we have weird lines, that, that we have uh, you know, racist, you know, racist and, and racial gerrymandered lines, but that we also have lines that go outside of Jefferson County because anybody who has a slice of your county gets to sit on that committee. So Jefferson County in particular is split 
way more. Look, we know that Jefferson County has a lot of people in it, that we are going to have a lot of house districts, but we have far more house districts on this map than we need to. Um, I have lost my note on the exact number. Uh, but for example, in the Senate, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, um, we've got enough people for 4.7. Senate districts, um, and we actually have seven. And I know there's a similar ratio for the House. And unfortunately, there's too many lines for me to count really quickly. I'll say um, I knew that answer. <laughs> please, please. We give have, it. Yes, um, please. We, if you, the, the population um, can make 14, but we have 17. Apparently. There you go. Yeah. And every one of those extra districts that go outside of these lines um, are usually white, rural, and Republican districts. So, um, uh, Tish, if you've got the map pulled up, if you're the one controlling that, if you look at Walker uh, County, so if you can just sort of like uh, circle around or use your mouse to circle around that pink district, District 14, yeah. Do you see that little, little, little tip that's coming into, Bur into, into Jefferson County? So the person who represents District 14 gets to sit on Jefferson County uh, Committee, gets to pass legislation about Jefferson County, gets to determine Jefferson County citizens' lives, even though they represent that little, little, little slice right there. So um, this is not just the case for Jefferson County. This is the case for multiple counties across our state. Um, off the top of my head, I believe uh, Mobile is also represented, as is Tuscaloosa, Montgomery. Um, uh, I know that um, pretty sure Madison is as well and a number of other counties. So this is definitely an issue that is spread across the state. Um, I'm just going to jump over to Tuscaloosa real quickly and then we can, um, I can sum up uh, Shelby and um, pass it off to my, my fellow panelists. So if you look at Tuscaloosa, um, Tuscaloosa is split so many different ways again, beyond what is necessary. Uh, but in particular, they've really split up the, the black population in Tuscaloosa between these different arms that are coming in. Now, it might not strike you as problematic immediately because some of these arms that are coming in grabbing pieces of Tuscaloosa are coming from the black belt. Uh, but what you're, what you're doing there is, you know, you, you not, might not have the same needs as a constituent who is in a more rural area you know, your concerns are going to be a little bit different. You deserve representation that is responsive to what you need in your area. And when we have these districts like this that are, I mean, I don't think that quite counts as a Pac-Man district, uh, District 71, but it does sort of look like a monster kind of coming up and maybe swallowing District 72. Um, it's definitely very odd looking. Um, when you have a district like that, even if um, by the numbers you might have something closer to, to fair representation. I mean, just imagine if you live in Marengo, but you're also, you have part of your district is, is a slice of Tuscaloosa in an urban area. You have very, very, very different needs and concerns. And it's gonna be hard to get, even if you have a great rep, even if you love your representative, it's gonna be hard to get, um, you know, a response to that, um, responsive, responsive to your, your direct needs. Um, so I promise I'd hit Shelby County really quickly. Um, so Shelby County um, on its surface doesn't look too bad uh, compared to some of the other areas we've looked at. Um, in fact, some of you may have heard me um, go off about Alabaster before, um, but there, there are some very strange things. Now, I don't think this map is detailed enough to show you, but right next to Alabaster, there's this weird little cutout. Um, and this is something that actually happens all over this map where there's just sort of a square of like a neighborhood that, that is fully protruding into another district. So it's like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a very odd sort of leftover artifact where you're just grabbing like this one neighborhood. Um, and it's, it's quite obvious uh, what they're trying to do there is it's either racial gerrymandering or partisan gerrymandering. Um, and so we, we see that echoing in a few different places as well. But I think that that little district next to Alabaster and there's one up in, um, North Alabama as well, that's particularly obvious. Okay. Uh, does anybody uh, else want to speak? <laughs> so like if that part in uh, 14 that goes into Jefferson County, that person could live in say Double Springs, Alabama, right? To tell you exactly where they live actually, it's uh, 14, right? Uh-huh. Give me one second. And that's? Yeah, it's Double Springs. Yep. 
And they're representing people in Jefferson County. So that's- The person who lives in 14 lives by uh, Wadsworth. Right there, with, yeah. Where? That, that blue dot. It's, uh, it's already outlined that, so those blue dots are where representatives live. Okay. So that's, that's where that person lives and they're representing that piece of Jefferson County. Great. So okay. if you go down to Tuscaloosa again, if you can just scroll down just a little bit, I forgot that this was overlaid on this map. So you can see in Tuscaloosa, if you just scroll down a little. I think my screen may have frozen. So somebody tell me if it's scrolled down. It didn't scroll, huh? -uh, it didn't. <clears throat> okay. Oh, there. there we go. Okay, so can you see how there's, um, it's a little bit hidden, but you can see like Chris England lives right there, but you can see that, uh, what is that, Howard uh, for District 72, they've got a piece of Tuscaloosa, but look, they live all the way down there. And then Sullivan at least lives within Tuscaloosa County, but then they're also represented, uh, District 16 is all the way above. Um, that also is a, what, half of Tuscaloosa County does not live in the county. And you see that um, represented across the map as well, where people are representing counties. I mean, we do have rural counties. This is, this is sort of inevitable, but it's just the sheer number of them is, is very obvious that, you know, you've got a lot of representatives who don't live anywhere near the communities that they actually represent. Okay, thank you. Hey, Kadita, do you have any um, um, other um, thoughts on this? And you're, you're muted. I was going to mention uh, District 68 that Cindy talked about. Um, she talked about Uniontown. I don't want to reiterate that. Um, I also was going to talk about um, District 30, no, the district below 31. I can't see. Um, that seems like 75. Yeah, where Representative Holmes, they kind of, it's weirdly drawn um, when they went up and added more for District 75, um, as well as um, we already spoke about District 74 in Montgomery, uh, a possible flip change to from a Republican district to a Democratic district. Um, and those were those were all that I said. And then adding on to what Felicia said, I didn't want to reiterate what others have already said. OK, thank you very much, Kadita. Cindy, do you have any? Uh... Well, maybe just point to you on the map that Uniontown, because everybody might not have known where that was, and I didn't have the map up, so it's kind of oh. interesting. Yeah, Uniontown is. Oh, did you want to do that, Cindy? I'm sorry. No, I I, I don't have access to the map. Oh, what um, district number is that? It's it in looks 68, like. But if you go down to go to District 67 and you see that blue part at the end of Perry County, the little blue square. Yep. yep. 67. You're close. There. Yeah, right there. Yeah. So previously, Uniontown used to be in District 72. Um, so I think that whole shape is extremely weird. I don't, it's very drawn very weird, but it used to be represented by uh, Representative Ralph Howard, but now they have drawn it into 68. And that, that looks like that's like, what? Four different counties, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah four different counties. And I know, I think overall, Felicia, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was 57 county precinct, county splits, or was that 57 precinct splits within the middle part of Alabama? Do you remember? Within the middle? I don't know. I, I know that, so 28 counties aren't split at all. We've got 67, right? So the remainder are split in some way. Um, <laughs> Two counties are split across nine districts and one county split across 17. Uh, wow. Bets on which one that is, uh, it's Jefferson. But I mean, if you look at these sort of middle range numbers, like five counties are split across seven districts, four wow. counties are split across four districts, eight counties are split across three districts, like that sort of middle range of, you know, yes, we know Jefferson County's really big. We know Madison's really big, but look at the, these smaller counties. Look at Coffee County. Coffee County is split into three different um, seats. Yeah. So, we're, so we're looking at the Wiregrass region. They only have one representative that lives within Coffee County, and I mean, they are like right on the line. Um, and Coffee County is not, not particularly populous. Um, you see the same thing sort of getting replicated in, um, in 84, which is Barbara, Russell, and Bullock, right? You've got um, one person lives. Um, I think that's, no, that's not Phoenix City. I'm not, I'm, 
disoriented as to which which city that is but you know there's just one person that lives in there um so nobody lives in russell and nobody no representative lives in bullock um no representative lives in crenshaw you know they these things they don't seem like a big deal at first but i mean they they add up so you know if you just look at the total number of representatives that live in each region you know the wiregrass doesn't have a lot living right there and then you have like this higher concentration which yes of course there's a higher concentration where there's more people but this is more than that there's more of a dispersal than there needs to be yeah and i just looked at my notes it's 57 precinct split yep um, so I'll, I'll just say from since I'm, so i'm being official as my league of women voter greater birmingham hat representing their their voices our voices um that was the main concern that we had was the way was the the um the way that Birmingham, the Jefferson greater Birmingham area is split up in so many different ways. It's, it could be less based on population. It could be 14 at 17 in Jefferson County. So that was our main concern. The other is um, just, just upon glancing, there's a lot of, you know, when you look at politics in the greater Birmingham area, there's a lot of challenges that surround are surrounded by regional cooperation or lack of regional cooperation. And to me, these lines, seem to kind of perpetuate that they don't seem to be thinking about how do we work together more as a as a metro area so that's the that's final the final note i just want to make um is that uh, we talk a lot about county splits as we should and there are a lot of reasons to but um the the demographers are supposed to not split municipalities as best as possible as well Obviously, when you're talking about really big cities like Birmingham, like that's impossible. But when you look at some of these town splits, they don't make sense. They're not big towns. So, for example, Adamsville is split into three different districts, and they've got like uh, 4,300 people in one district, and they have 19, one nine, 19, not even two dozen people in another district. And that happens in a few different places as well. So, like Altoona, 906 people are in one district, and 42 are in another. Um, Alabaster is only split down the middle, but they're a bit more populous. That makes a little more sense. Argo, 4,000 people in one district, 61 people in another district. You know, it, when you have those little numbers like that, can you imagine like most of your small town is in one district and then you're one of a couple dozen people that just happens to have this completely different rep who probably doesn't even live near you. The most egregious is Bessemer. <laughs> Bessemer's got 23,000 people in one district, 2,000 people in a second district, and the third district has one person. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this happens in Senate too. <laughs> happens in Bruton as well. Same thing. 5,275 people in one district, one person in another district. All right. Um, Thank you so much. We appreciate your insights and uh, taking the time out tonight. And I know you've had to work hard to do this review so quickly. Uh, up next is uh, uh, North Alabama, and tonight we have uh, uh, Robin Bucklew, we have Patricia King, and we also have Stephanie Barnett, who is our crowd fellow. So can you, um, let's start off with Pat, can you give us kind of an insights on what, what your review has uh, shown so far? Well, as a group, we concentrated um, in North Alabama, and what we found was that Alabama A&M, there is a street named Meridian Street. We're talking about houses, house districts, not Senate. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, on, on the house side, um, districts that we are concerned with is District 53 and 19. What they did to 19 they changed the northern part of 19 and included some more predominantly um, black precincts. And I believe if I remember right, cause we've been looking a whole lot. I believe they cut some out of the South and in district 53, they added additional black precincts and took out some of the white precincts so that the other pre the other districts of the house made them more white. So we're talking about 53 and 19. Okay. 
<clears throat> and I, I just want to bring up, I think we're, um, there are in nine house districts in, in, in Madison County, is that correct? It's broken into nine house districts. And um, Limestone is broken into five districts. And if you did just a, you know, average based on the population, Limestone should would have like 2.1 representatives. I, don't, I think that was an interesting insight too into what's going on. And is it the house district um, from Limestone? It gently dips over into Madison? Madison yes. County. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay, Robin, do you uh, have some, what are your thoughts on this, the map in North Alabama? You're, you're, you're muted. I just had a general concern that what we're seeing in North Alabama, and I suspect in other parts of the state, is that the urban districts have been packed to the max. So they approach a 5% overage. And those districts are the very ones that are gonna be growing rapidly in the coming years. And what that effectively does is it dilutes the ability of urban voters to affect elections and it enhances the ability of rural voters because there are fewer in each of the districts. And this is a trend. You have a, a an allowance for five percent overage, but parts of the cities in the state are growing so rapidly that that overage could approach ten percent within just a few years. If it hasn't already, right? <clears throat> well, it's probably going to hit over five percent tomorrow morning. Yeah. And I, I think we we noticed that all the districts, all the representatives in Madison are over. Um, none of them are under. That is correct. And Limestone, I believe, is the same way. So you have to go to the rural areas outside to see where you finally get to something that's below average. That is correct. I thought I'd throw in the growth rates that we looked up this afternoon for um, limestone and, and um, for, lime, for Madison County in 2020, they had a 1.58% growth rate. And since 2017, the annual growth rate has been 1.4% or more. So that's what, when Robin was talking about, it's rap we're rapidly getting to that point. Um, limestone County has had an annual growth rate this, of this year, 2020 or last year, of 2.77% and it's been over 2% 2 since 2018. So, you know, you're, that's what they're talking about when she says they're gonna hit over that much. And Baldwin County had a 27.16% growth rate over the last 10 years, which is an annualized rate of 2.7%. Uh, and so that tells you right now that when, when they have, when they get you already in this map up to 4.9%, you know, when, when Kendra mentioned that about the, the, the concern that Mike Ball mentioned about the growth rate, he was, you know, he, he was being, I think he was being nice about it because what's basically happening is they're going to break that cap before they even baseline their maps. Well, it, it kind of strikes at the issue that you just wonder if they shouldn't just have another legislation, legislature district there another house district in that area, um, and then you could spread it out and everybody would have more, their votes would count more. They wouldn't be minimalized. Well, one might suspect that this is just a continuation of the state's historical tendency to leave power in the rural areas and diminish it in the urban areas. Okay, Stephanie, you got any uh, comments tonight? Yeah, um, just as a uh, point of reference, um, something that I had noticed when I was looking at these maps is that um, I did live in District 6 and now I live in District 19 and um, genuinely I'm just a hair um, over from 
I'm in an interesting area of Huntsville that has seen exponential growth, um, which is funny that you mentioned that Madison County and Limestone County, which is not that far from where I live, um, are all in a positive deviation. And so we're seeing all this growth. And I mean, I live in an area that has plenty of apartment complexes that are being built. And yet um, we have uh, <laughs> extensive um, uh, deviation. And so it's just really interesting to look at that and how they think that uh, our power is um, being split up. I mean, the district that I was in, District 6, is now primarily rural. And then now um, mine is, is pri primarily urban um, and in uh, Laura Hall's district. And so um, the way that they splice it up and it didn't make sense before, it still doesn't make sense. Um, I mean, you're really just cutting through, doing slivers of Huntsville quite literally um, and, and like they did before, but and are still doing, they're kind of doing this um, motioning around, uh, kind of beating around some of um, Huntsville to um, taking rural and then taking a sliver of um, a part of Huntsville that kind of, so that they can get their population up. But of, but of course it's primarily rural. Um, Madison and Limestone County residents. So it's just, it's been interesting looking at this. Um, I wish I had days pulled up but their website is not functioning properly. I was going to give a little bit more detailed analysis. Yeah. But, um, unfortunately, these, uh, these maps that Representative England provided, uh, we'll just have to do. But he did say something I caught, um, just real quick, that I caught him saying in um, the uh, session today was, um, and I was, I was quite pleased with this. Uh, he made a couple of comments saying that um, it's not the representative seat, but it is the constituency. And um, just making a point about how he he himself didn't like Tuscaloosa's maps, but it didn't matter what he thought. Um, it was about what the constituents wanted and how they are um, living in their communities and how the maps are drawn to avoid certain communities, right? And so I just thought that was a really good point. Um, and I wish that um, more people agreed with that kind of statement because uh, he went on to say that it really diminishes the funds um, for things like schools. Um, and I really think that applies uh, very much in Madison County as well. And so um, just seeing um, the numbers uh, like Pat and Robin have already talked about with 19 and 53, um, the way that it impacts their schools and their communities, as well as the other districts and um, just different power rising. And um, so, yes, I concur with Pat and Robin, <laughs> aside from what I said. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your quick review of these maps. And I'll just a reminder, tomorrow night, we're going to be looking at the Alabama Senate maps. So, Pat, you can bring up what you were going to say tonight, okay? <laughs> All right. And, and tonight, we also have Anisha Hardy with Alabama Values and Rodricia Russo with AEPN to talk about how Alabama citizens can get involved and make sure their voices are being heard. Kathy, if you could spotlight Anisha and Rodricia. Are we on? Are we on? I, I think Pam is still on. Um, <laughs> you are on, Miss Anisha. Okay, awesome. Is Rodricia on with me as well? Got it. She's got to turn her camera on. Oh, she's got to turn got my camera on, you guys. <laughs> there we All go. Right. All right. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, my name is Rodricia Russo. I'm with um, Alabama Election Protection Network, also uh, the Ordinary People Society, proud board member of Alabama Forward. Tonight we have Miss Anisha that is on the line. We're going to be talking a little bit about civic engagement and how you can participate. We appreciate the, the League of Women Voters for this dynamic conversation and mapping because as we know the civic engagement is a large portion of redistricting it is important that we've even seen in our last census data that everything that pertained to redistricting had to follow behind the census data and so we are asking all of you guys continue to vote because voting is 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 the key to making sure that redistricting is happening so um anisha 
Yes, thank you, Rajisha. So, hello, everyone. My name is Anisha Hardy. I am the Executive Director of Alabama Values, and we're a state-based communications hub, and pretty much we spend our time and dedicate our time to raising awareness around the Alabama democratic processes and creating cool content, um, also clipping videos uh, for, you know, storage and to share with the public, kind of like what you seen earlier um, when Kendra went through her, her spiel um, and just creating visual stories and amplifying the work of grassroots and civic organizations such as uh, the organizations that are co-sponsoring this community forum. So uh, definitely thank you to all the speakers for providing such insightful information regarding redistricting and to the crowd fellows for discussing the maps. Now you may be wondering how can you get involved with this process or if there's anything you can do to be a part of this movement to build a better Alabama. Um, you know, um, in terms of getting involved with redistricting or other civic participatory activities. And it can seem like a large task, you know, I get it. Uh, and so I'm excited to share with you, um, as I mentioned, we'll be sharing each night um, an organization or resource uh, that could help you be a change maker right here in Alabama um, with the resources that you have. So I'm, I want to share shakethefield.org and it is a digital space uh, that operates at the intersection of civic engagement and culture. Uh, pretty much their mission is to educate um, and implore Alabamians to embrace civic engagement and become active um, while also becoming active in Alabama's artistic and cultural communities. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Yes. All right. Thanks for the love. I hear someone saying, yay, I love Shake the Field. <laughs> Lindy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, and share. So you should be seeing my screen now. Um, hold on. It's in the way. Okay, so one of the coolest features, in my opinion, um, on the website, again, this is all in a digital space. Um, do follow them on social media at Shake the Field AL um, on all your major platforms, Facebook, Twitter, um, IG. But um, the field is Alabama and they've given different regions a name. And if you're wondering where to start, um, this is a great place to start on the site. You can click um, on one of the regions and find out information about that region. Um, and also connect with organizations, um, those region, regional organizations within that within the region that you select. Um, and as well as you may be wondering, okay, well, what you know, what are some other ways that I can tap in? Uh, and as they would say, be a shaker, be a change maker. Um, they have you know some points like how you can get involved and step on the field, and you know just everyday Alabamians um, being a part of the change. Um, and then also, if you are an organization, um, they also have ways that you can be a part of uh, the collective. There's power in the collective, right? Um, to where you could, you know, get involved and tap in and, and collaborate with organizations such as those that are co-sponsoring this event. Um, the feature that they'll have coming soon, um, which is all the field tests, because you may say, okay, well, I just really don't know where to tap in. So they'll have a, a series of questions that you can just answer. I mean, it will pop up and make some recommendations for you. So again, um, the website is shakethefield.org. Uh, and it's a way to, like I said, just tap into what's going on in Alabama, uh, civic engagement, uh, uh, civic you know, awareness uh, scene. And I encourage, encourage everyone to visit it. Again, that's shakethefield.org. I will put it in the chat if Ardrisha hasn't already. But I will. Hold on. Here we All right. go. Uh, thank you for covering that once again. Shake the field, y'all. Please throw down with us coming up, especially for our 2020 elections. We want to definitely hit more communities. And as Anisha pointed out, Alabama uh, Ford works with a host of grassroots organizations that works on the front line of civic participation, bringing the most information on how to engage in your community and also providing election protection across the board. Um, as she mentioned, you can be a change maker no matter where you are and no matter what area you're in. There are several ways for you to get involved. We ask for you to get involved now um, because Alabama civic engagement is at the core of our work. And remember, you must contact your legislators. As our last forum that we had, we spoke about contacting our legislators on voteprotection.org, letting them know about your redistricting concerns and matters. So once again, we thank you for your support and we look forward to your civic engagement participation. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. And I'm sorry for that, Patricia. Your camera kept going on and off. Sorry about that. that. And we we're living in this virtual space. So yeah. we're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can deal with it. Hey, thank you everyone for all that you're doing to inform the citizens of Alabama on the redistricting process and how they can get involved. I think it's very important. I do hope everybody will come back tomorrow night, September 2nd, for our third part where we will discuss the uh, Alabama Senate maps, the Alabama State Senate maps, and, and what those look like and what the impacts we think are coming out of that. Appreciate everybody. I hope everybody has a good night. Thank you very much. We don't have any questions, so we're just gonna end it. Thank you. All right. Thank you.